So we'll start today's Saturday session off with a little bit on uh, understanding the structure of lymph nodes and their function in the immune system. We'll identify the major lymphatic nodes of the body, and this ties really closely with the spleen. And then we'll talk a little bit about the histological components of the lymph node and talk a little bit about the cortex, the medulla, sinuses, mostly highlighting the anatomical features. We'll talk a little bit about the blood supply, so vascular supply to these structures. And we'll also go over the red and white polyp. So those regions are critical for the cell types that are found inside the spleen. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the pancreas. So that's where, well, this is the first time we're going to go over an exocrine endocrine gland. We're going to have a dedicated endocrine topic towards the end. So that'll probably be the last two modules that we'll go over for this course. And then as we go into pancreas, we'll go over the head, the body, the tail, talk about the cell types, and then some of the histological components. And of course, the islets of Langerhans. Okay, so those are the key items. And then for the cadaver images, like I said, won't be too bad, only four of them, but I will be presenting a case study today. So we'll be using a kind of a question case style in addition to our top hat questions. Part of the reason is because it's just a little bit more engaging, but also it is um, a good transition as we kind of get through the tail end of this course, okay? All right, so we'll start our lecture off today with a little bit on what the spleen and pancreas location is. So spleen is located in the upper LEQ, upper left abdominal quadrant. This is a pretty interesting organ because that you can palpitate this if the organ is enlarged. Oftentimes, and one of the manipulations is using those uh, medicine tables and those um, kind of, if you use like a, like a recliner or even a, a chair, you could take a deep breath and then take any of your fingers, or usually your middle finger, and you just kind of feel right under your coastal space on your left side, you can palpitate the ridge of your spleen. Okay, so you take a deep breath in, use your middle finger and just palpitate it. You can feel the ridge on the left side. And if it's enlarged, you will feel a, a kind of a, a, a protruded a bulb. And so that's usually one of the, the quick assessments to see if you have a, a ruptured or potentially enlarged spleen. It fits right at the inferior surface of our diaphragm. So on the right of this image, so you can see the spleen outlined right here. So it's nicely highlighted. You can see the purple color. So it's right here. And you can, if you were to take your finger and just wrap underneath your coastal space, you can feel it. It's more specifically lined between your ninth and 11th rib. But usually when you palpitate, you go under the 12th. So you go into the 12th rib, under it, and you feel it. You don't go between the ribs because the ribs are just too narrow, okay? And then the second organ that we're going to go over today is the pancreas. The pancreas lies between the L1, L2 vertebrae, and this is the one that's not palpable, okay? Because it's too deep. It sits right on that curvature of the duodenum. Anybody remember how many sections there are in the duodenum from last week? Four, okay, there's four, right? So there's four subsections, and then it joins into the jejunium and then the ileum. All right, good. So let's take a look. So the first structure that we're going to go over is the uh, lymph lymphatic fluids, and the lymphatic fluids drain into the lymphatic ducts. Throughout your body, from head to toe, you're going to have these strategically positioned called lymph nodes. Lymph nodes serve to trap various types of pathogens, and the whole point is during immune response, your body has a location to get all the, the waste, the cell debris, the pathogens accumulated in an area. A lot of activity goes on, so phagocytosis via the neutrophils, macrophages can, can go in there. Uh, but most of the time, you're going to have some general anatomy, and this is very similar to what you'll see in the spleen, okay? So for a general lymph node, the outer region, this is the capsule. Okay, I'll highlight the capsule for you. This is shown here in red. And then in the inner core, this region is called medulla. All right, I'm going to fill it in with the medulla. And then within the cortex, which is the sub-layer between the outer capsule and the inner medulla, you're going to have a lot of these smaller geminal centers. Geminal centers contain all the different cell types that eventually mature. So we'll talk a little bit about the five, so really quickly, briefly, five classes of white blood cells, right? There's three that are granular sites, right? So, so what are the granular sites, anybody? The five types of white blood cells, neutrophil, Basophil, isosinophil, lymphocyte, macrophage, right? So five of these, 
out of the five, there are three that are granular sites. That means inside the cytoplasm, they have these little specks and granules. And then we have two that are agranular, okay? Neutrophils being the most commonly found, like 65, 70%, but they're policing all over and they maintain you know, kind of the integrity and the pushing of pathogens in towards lymph nodes. But you have a slow flow of these drainage fluids that go in, gives it time to filter. And then what's important is there's always multiple afferent entryways on the bottom here. There's multiple, even though the picture shows you one, there's multiple entryways into a lymph node. There's typically only one efferent exiting out. Okay, so many go in, one comes out. The region by which it exits out, you can see it looks like a kidney bean shaped organ, is called the hilum. Okay, the hilum is this exiting portion where that efferent tube drains outwards. All right, so let's take a look. So lymph nodes uh, kind of proximate around the body, about 600 plus minus, and they're distributed from head to toe. You're gonna have a little bit more accumulation in certain strategic areas of the body, especially around the mammillary glands, the axillary region, the groin area. There's a lot more in those areas. They serve as the drainage of fat as well as lymphatic fluid. So it's counter opposite the blood flow. It's very important because when you have excess fluid, it's maintained through lymphatic drainage. Okay, so when, whenever the blood is being filtered through the capillaries, you have this hydrostatic force that pushes the fluid and water gets pushed out. Then on the venial side, the water and the fluid needs to be reabsorbed back in. Okay, if there's an imbalance or an excess of fluid, it can drain into the lymphatic ducts. And if that doesn't work, then you have the edema. So on average, each lymph node ranges about one to 25 millimeters. Obviously what happens during an infection? When you're sick, what happens in the lymph nodes? Do they get bigger or smaller? Swollen, right? They get bigger. And so the size will, will vary. On the outside, we have the cortex. Deep inside, we have the medulla. And then within the substructure, so not dividing the two layers, we have the inner core called the trabecula. The trabecula is divided into subcomponents. So the stroma is the framework of all the reticular fibers that give rise to that structure. So it looks like a kidney bean shape. And then we also have the fibroblasts that give rise to collagen. But on the right here, I'll just zoom in just a little bit to show you all the different cell types. Let's go zoom in just a little bit. So on the right side, you can see a few kinds of cells. So in the inner core of the cortex, mostly you're gonna find two kinds of cells. T cells, as well as nodular dendritic cells. These ones can track and entangle form debris. T cells, we're not gonna go into all the subclasses, but we have the CD4s and CD8s, okay? We have the helper T, cytotoxic Ts. And then of course, there's the regulator T, so some of these more inter intermediate uh, signal-based cell types. In the germinal centers, you're gonna find these kinds, okay? This is the key. B cells, nodular dendritic as well, but also macrophages, okay? So each of the sub-region of a lymph node you will find slightly different cell types. That, that's what I want you to know. Then when you go into the core or the medulla, the real center, it's mostly gonna be plasmacytes or the precursor B cells. These ones eventually give rise to that selection process. They call that colonial selection, where the cells are gonna interact with these receptors known as the MHCs. We're not gonna go into all those interactions, but the MHCs will tag on to either foreign cells or innate cells. And if it doesn't tag on, then they get destroyed. Okay, so real quickly, inner cortex, we have T cells, nodular cells. The outer geminal centers, we have B cells, nodular cells, and macrophages. And in the core, we have B cells and macrophages. Okay, so three broad regions and three sets of different players or cell types. We'll come back to this. And then on the bottom here, just showing you Again, a little bit more of the anatomy. You can see there's numerous afferent lymphatic drainage. So you can see there's two of these green arrows. There's a lot of these arrows going in, but there's really only one direction going out and it's all located inside the hilus. They're all approximately in the center of that bean-shaped structure. Okay. Now, within the lymph nodes, they transition. Primary lymph nodes are what we begin with. So throughout our... Our, our, our normal life, these lymph nodes are there. And when you get sick or get infections, they then transition from a primary to a secondary. So the transition occurs as may, mainly due to the changes of cell types. So the B cells 
will then go through that process of colonal expansion and then go through the conversion to the memory B. So you've seen some sort of pathogen and your cells have detected an antigen. And then inside the germinal centers, those nodular cells that I've talked about, those nodular dendritic cells begin to activate. And these nodular cells play a key role for presenting the antigen, okay? Just as far as our class goes, just know that there are two processes in antigen presentation. There's proliferation and differentiation. Proliferation means you're exposing the cell to say, hey, this is the cell. This is the target that we're going to try to locate. And then the differentiation is now we're going to divide and then multiply more. Okay, so there's two sub processes. And then over the course of time, what's very powerful about our adaptive immune system is that we have memory. At the moment you've encountered a vaccine, the moment you've encountered a specific illness, your body has had seen that foreign pathogen. So now you have the ability to quickly reactivate and need it. And then whenever cells that do not bind and interact with receptors, they're going to go through apoptosis to cell death. So over here within the inner cortex, or also known as some books called the paracortex, this is an older term. This is what lacks most of the, uh, well, this is where most of the B cells do not accumulate. This is where T cells accumulate. And also you're still going to have the same nodular dendritic cells. So these are found throughout, but this is the process of kind of simulation of T cell proliferation. So we're transitioning into the CD4, CD8 cell growth. Most of the time, the newly formed T cells will then quickly migrate out. So you're pumping out T cells, even though they mostly mature in your thymus, these little sites throughout the body are, are strategic to be able to get those T cells out quickly. Within the medulla, a few things I wanna highlight is you have most of those memory B cells, the antibody producing plasma sites, and it's mostly gonna be reticular fibers. So whenever you do a histological smear, and this is the image that I want to zoom into. So if you look on the right side, right, if you're looking at just a cross section of some random organ or a biopsy, and you're like, what, what is this? So in the lymph nodes, very similar to the spleen is that it's very, very tightly packed. A few things you'll see over here, if we zoom into one of these geminal centers, this is where most of the cells are accumulated. You can see on the right side, there's tons of macrophages and tons of lymphocytes. Okay, these are the round circular cells. Is lymphocytes a granular site or a granular site? A granular, right? The lymphocytes are small, they're tiny. The nucleus is usually really round. In terms of size, they're not nearly as big as a neutrophil or a macrophage. Macrophages are gonna be a little bit bigger. And then you're also gonna have these little gaps called the medullary sinuses. These are the hollow cavity depression. And of course, all these little lines, you see these little webs that I'm trying to trace, these are all the reticular fibers, okay? And then over here, just notice that the inner region is called the medulla on the bottom. So bottom part of the picture, this is all medulla. And then the upper portion is going to be your cortex. And then this outer layer is the capsule, okay? So just remember, it's on the outside, we have the capsule. We're gonna have the cortex. We're gonna have the medulla. This is gonna be literally a mirror image, almost analogous to your spleen. Okay, very similar. All right, here we go. So now we went over the cortex and the medulla. So this is the pathway of flow. This is gonna be helpful for you to understand how the, the lymphatic drainage enters in a lymph node, as well as as it eventually makes its way to your spleen, right? That's where majority of the red blood cells go for destruction, cell death occurs over there processing. A lot of the Hemoglobin gets removed and converted into bilirubin and biliverdin, but the flow of the lymphatic drainage goes as follows. So many, many afferent lymphatic vessels enter in. They're going to penetrate the outer convex surface of a lymph node. As they come right in, it's going to go through a set of valves. So very similar to the veins, you have valves that ensure one-way flow. How do you get the, the fluid to move? Anybody? How would you ensure because there is no mechanical pump, there is no cardiovascular system tied to this, how do you get the fluid to circulate? How, how do you close the valves? How do you make sure the valves are working? Any ideas? Pressure? Okay, good, yeah. So pressure, well, how do you generate the pressure? Just the blood flow, maybe next to it? Or, or what? Or what else?
Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times when you have the circulation working, right, the blood flow working and the blood pressure squeezing against tissues and against organs and, and CT, you're going to elate uh, now the fluid to also drain, but also movement, right? Just contraction of muscle, your breathing, right? The ability to move actually moves lymphatic fluid. So if there's one thing to be mindful of is when you're stationary or bedridden, one of the pitfalls is not being able to circulate your lymphatic drainage. So all the waste accumulates in nodes, causing you to have less circulation, right? And that ultimately is not a good. So eventually there's going to be a lymphatic duct where the lymphatic drainage goes back into the blood vessels and then you can urinate and get rid of this stuff. Then we, hot, we drain into the sinuses. The sinuses contain mostly the reticular fibers, lymphocytes, and macrophages. That's where majority of the interactions take place, where the waste, the pathogens are going to encounter the immune system. Then as it exits out towards the outer regions of the sinus, we're going to drain into the subcapillary sinuses, then deeper into the trabecular sinus, then eventually the medullary sinus. So I want to highlight that the subscapular is the first, then trabecular, then medullary. Okay, so there's a chronological order in terms of going from the outer to that middle layer to the inner layer. And then the final portion is now when you're done with the drainage system after all the cells are activated and encountered with the B cells and they proliferate, there's going to be usually one or two at most of efferent vessels for the exiting portion. Okay, typically, again, numerous entryways, but only one exit way. So it makes sure that most of whatever you're trying to get rid of or whatever you want to see, right, is ensured to meet in the lymph node. There is no exit. And it makes sense because your body's immune system, you know, relies on this. Now, closely linked to the lymph nodes is going to be your spleen. Okay, your spleen is the organ that we're going to go over today. This is the one that we said is literally the largest immune lymphatic related organ of the body. Measures about 12 centimeters in length. This is going to be about five inches, and it's located towards the stomach and the diaphragm. So this is enclosed by two big structures. The region by which the stomach and diaphragm lock in on the spleen is called the hypochondriac region. Okay, so that's a specific location. The spleen is also very vulnerable. It can rupture. It can also cause a lot of pain. It can enlarge and gorge a little bit, but it conforms directly to the, the, the dome of diaphragm. So it's sitting on the left upper quadrant. There are three anatomical impressions that you have to be mindful of depending on the position. Anato in the anatomical position, anterior view, posterior view, and also towards the lateral view, we have the gastric impression. This is going to be the first kind of concave indentation where the stomach presses against the spleen. The renal impression is where the kidney touches in. And then the colic is going to be only for the left flexure of the large intestine. Okay. So your small intestines do not directly touch any part of your spleen. Okay. It's only these three organs, your stomach, your kidney, and then the left flexure of your large intestine. That's where it sits. All right. And that's also important because when you are palpitating for it, typically what's the upper, what's also in the upper left quadrant from last week, which structure is also upper left quadrant? Anybody? No, not the stomach. Which one? The ilium. Ilium, remember? Ilium, okay? All right, so remember, we have a couple, because those are, remember, the two organs are intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. Remember this? So last week, we covered organs that are interior, intraperitoneal with the mesentery coming over, and the retroperitoneal are the ones like the kidneys in the back. So you have to be mindful. So which one's intra and retro? And then the hilum of the spleen, so literally the term hilum is used also in the lymph nodes, right? So some of these anatomical features are overlapping. They pass through the key blood vessels, which we'll talk about, the splenic artery. It's going to then be supplied via the splenic vein. And then you're also going to have a good amount of lymphatic efferent lymphatic vessels here and also sympathetic nerves. Let me show you the right side. So if you were to take a biopsy of a spleen, if you just take a little small section and you tease it open, if you look closely, oh. If you look on the bottom right of this image, you can see that it's very similar to the medulla of the lymph node. Many, many cells tightly packed. Because of the size of this image, it's hard to see what kind of cell types. But when you look closely on the red edges on these borders, I'm using the color. 
So around the edges shown in blue, these regions have a little bit more redder tint. And then in the core, it's a little bit lighter in color. Right? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the two polyps in a second. But that's the kind of two broad cell types found inside your spleen. Okay, so let's go into some of the key structures. So within the spleen, very similar. So you're going to see a lot of the terms I highlighted for you and put in bold are literally overlapping with the lymph nodes. It's mostly dense connective tissue, and you also still have a trabecula. The trabecula is going to be that supportive framework inside the core of your spleen. It's mostly composed of which kind of fibers? Reticular, right? The reticular generally looks a little bit more strandy, more webby. It's very thin and almost looks kind of like spider webs, sometimes on histological image in, in comparison to collagen. And then you're also going to find tons of fibroblasts that give rise to collagen. And of course, collectively, they form the stroma. Okay, so again, the exact same terminology used for a lymph node. Now, within the cell type, we have two major parenchymal cells, and this is what differentiates the spleen from a lymph node. We have the white polyp and also the red polyp, okay? And this is important. So the white polyp is mostly only lymphocytes and macrophages, so it's very similar to the lymph node's cortex, right, the outer cortex. And then the red polyp is mostly blood-filled venous drainage, but it contains a very unique set of tissue called the splenic cords. This is also referred to as a Bill Roth's cord. This is another term where there's these tubes of vessel drainage. This is where most of the red blood cells get destroyed. So you're gonna have macrophages as well. You're gonna have some lymphocytes. You're gonna have some of these granulocytes like lymphocytes, macrophages, B cells, a little bit of plasmacytes, precursor B cells. But the main one is you're gonna find a lot of red blood cells, okay? You won't see red blood cell in any other structure except for in the red polyp. Otherwise there's bleeding. Okay, so you don't see traces of erythrocytes over there. So let's take a look at the histological image. So this one is, is pretty good. It's not, not perfect, but it's, it's actually pretty good. So if you look at the image on the right, you can see, first of all, the red polyp. Again, the red and white polyp, you can't just go off the color, but you can call out the density. So the density of the white polyp tends to be more in lumped. They're kind of grouped together in one bundle. The red polyps are usually more scattered out. They're more gapped out. The trabeculate is these core regions where the stroma is occurring. So there's going to be more of a structural support. It's almost like a web. Okay, this is where they're called the reticular fibers give rise to the structure of your organ. And then inside the white polyp, there's going to be small drainage. So this is the central artery. I circled it with uh, the, the blue in the bottom. And then these are all the cell types. So again, you're, you're finding litters of lymphocytes, macrophages. But in the red polyp, you will see red blood cells. You generally don't see the red blood cells in the white polyp. So that's, if you're zooming into microscope and you're looking at an image, that's how you differentiate the red and white pole. All right, so that is the spleen. And then, of course, we have a couple of external structures you have to be mindful of. And on the right, I actually have a pretty good cadaver image. This one, unfortunately, is not the one I have inside the cadaver set, but this is pretty good. So you can see it's, it's very dark tinted red. On the upper portion, we have the diaphragm. It's actually peeled over. And then on the bottom here, we have parts of your descending colon right here. So the, the right, sorry, the left flexure right here. So we'll cut over. And then we have parts of the stomach in the front. So you can see this is kind of where this the positioning, right? The location of your spleen is at. The main blood vessels is going to be going through the splenic artery. And then as it flows in, it's gonna disperse into smaller arteries called the central arteries. Those then carry out throughout all the white polyp. So you're gonna get a a massive amount of blood flow. It makes sense because this is where all the red blood cells go to, to get disrupted and, and get processed. And within this region, you're also going to have the ability for macrophages to trap white blood, uh, pathogens and any kind of antigens in this region for phagocytosis. Most of the time, when cells go through the breakdown and warn after that 90 day period, the red blood cells go and, and get recycled. You have the hemoglobin conversion, and then we go through also in early phases hemopoiesis during fetal life. So early on, it does play a role for generation of cells. On the bottom here, the cartoon image, you can see on the posterior, I'm sorry, superior region, you can see the main splenic artery coming in and it branches out to super many small fine branches. And these branches are then the central arteries and they all enter in also the hilum. So again, the, a lot of these terms is the same as lymph node. So that's why lymph node and the spleen, as far as anatomy goes, mirror. They're mirrored, okay? They look different, 
they have slightly different sizes, but they very similar terminology. So that's why it made sense to just hit the lymph nodes while we're going over this. So let's go over the key structures that support this. So the spleen is anchored via the peritoneum and the only part, and this is the tricky bit, the only part that is not intraperitoneal is the hilum. Okay, the hilum or the entryway is not supported directly. It is not surrounded by peritoneum. The contact region is going to be via two main ligaments. The first one is the gastrosplenic ligament. The name should tell you it all, right? Gastro refers to your stomach and then splenic, you have your spleen, right? And this is gonna be at the attachment of the greater curvature. So where is that? At? If you have your stomach, is the greater curvature towards superior or inferior? inferior, right? So it's on the bottom, really good. So it's going to be on the bottom side of your stomach. And that's where it's going to glue onto the spleen. The second contact will then be the splenal renal ligament. Okay, so it's going to touch their, the kidneys on the posterior side, the retroperitoneal. The main blood supply, as I mentioned, pretty straightforward, splenic artery, so make sure you know that. The main vein drainage is splenic vein. And then we also have the specific lymph nodes that accumulate around the spleen called the pancreatic the splenic lymph nodes. These are dedicated around this region. Even though most of it is in their axillary and your, your groins, you do have a good chunk right around your spleen as well. On the right side, I have a couple of images. Again, anatomy has to have visuals. The three borders you'll see are outlined. The gastric area, such as your stomach, and this is going to be shown in blue. The colic area, right, this is your left flexure of your large intestine, bless you, the red area. And then we have the renal area shown in green on the bottom, okay? What's also important here is on the renal area, what other organ also touches this is the pancreas. So which part of the pancreas do you think would touch the spleen? The tail, here, right? Because it makes sense, because if you think about it, your pancreas sits towards the duodenum. It's gonna be right by the summit. And so the end tail, and then real quick, is the tail of the pancreas intraperitoneal or is it retroperitoneal? Intra, okay, good, all right, remember that. That's the only one, right? Only one that's intraperitoneal, good. And then over here, you can see all the hilum. So this is where all of the ligaments are actually teased off, the blood vessels in the middle. And then we also have a region, a little leftover remnant of the omentum. Okay, so this, there's a lot going on, but most of the structures are more visible on the posterior side. On the right image, the reason why the spleen and pancreas are always together is most anatomical uh, books or any kind of image you're presented, they usually like to show you the pancreas with the spleen. So it's a very clean image, but you can see the spleen on the right side and you can see the tail of the pancreas touching. It sits right at that curvature, right, of the duodenum between the section one and two, so that, that superior version. And then we have the descending and on the bottom here, you can see the splenic artery right here. So very, very briefly, you can see the splenic artery branching off of the abdominal aorta, comes right off. And just make sure you know that in the in the abdominal aorta, you have those main branches, right? The superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric, the splenic artery, the renal. Those are the main branches that come off of that main highway. Good. Okay, so let's keep going. And then last but not the least is the nerve supply to the spleen is going to be via the celiac plexus. Okay, so celiac plexus is what subbranches out sympathetic division and it supplies the region. All right, so now the next structure that we're gonna cover that match really closely with your spleen is gonna be your pancreas. And the pancreas does also have, we, all, we kind of briefly talked a little bit about this already, the intraperitoneal, the head, the neck, the body, the tail, but we're gonna zoom into the cell type because there is some hormonal function that involves. So we're gonna go over the alpha, the beta cells, delta cells, those kind of different cell types that create different hormones. The general structure is simple. We have the head, neck, body, tail. The head contains a C-shaped curvature to fit nicely for that first section of the duodenum. And then we have the neck region, which is a brief little area between the body and the neck, the body and the head, sorry. And then the body itself is gonna contain the interior region of the splenic vein. That's where the blood vessels touch and then pass by. And then the, the, high, the tail is what touches the hilum of the spleen, okay? So I divide it out for you so it's very clear on which areas of the pancreas interact with which areas of the spleen. And of course, there are some drainage systems that we gotta map out. We have the common bile duct, 
coming down, leading to the bile duct. And then we have the pancreatic duodenal, uh, the, sorry, the hepatic pancreatic ampulla, the opening we went over last week. On the entryway, we have the, the ampulla. And then we also have the swollen region where the entryway comes together. This is the pancreas joining the bile duct, and there's a common common drainage site, right? So this is where there's two, two entryways. And of course, there are some conditions where if the ampulla sphincter is impaired or if there's a blockage or some sort of a damage like pancreatitis and cause it to enlarge. And when the pancreas enlarges, it might press onto the opening to reduce the exit way of the juices. Then you're gonna have improper digestion and that can cause inflammation, that kind of stuff. Okay, so bile duct, pancreatic unite, and they create this opening called the tidal pancreatic ampulla, the opening into the duodenum. As far as cell types goes, we're gonna zoom into four main cells, and I will talk a little bit about these four hormones and how they interact. So these are, this is nice because it's an introduction to our endocrine system, but the pancreas has multiple functions. Okay, this is one of those organs that have both an endocrine aspect and also an exocrine. Right? That means you have the enzymatic juices, but you also have those glandular cells that can make a dedicated hormone not created by any other cell in the body. So this is a flattened organ, nice kind of leaf, leaf shape. If you do a dissection or if you've ever seen a cadaver, it's actually very thin. It's like a little leaf and it spans about 12.5 to 15 centimeters, about five to six inches in length. The cell types that are exocrine are clustered called the pancreatic acini. These cell types are then scattered all around and there's gonna be smaller little specks of cells in little pockets called the islets of Langerhans. And these islets of Langerhans contain four cell types that make four different hormones. I'm gonna use a cartoon image because when they do histological uh, smear, most of the time to differentiate the cell type, you just gotta look at the location of the border as well as the cell size, but in general, it's pretty hard to, to decipher. But you, you'll see them, if you see the right side of the cartoon, they're all around these Langerhans cells, right? These islets, these little bundles of islets. We have the alpha cell. These are the ones that are generally found on the border region, on the edges of the islet. We have the beta cell. They're found a little bit more toward the center. And then we have the delta cells. These are also scattered around the beta cells. So it's very hard to discriminate between beta and delta cells. And then the last cell types are called the PP cells, with pancreatic polypeptide cells. The four secretions that they generate are as follows. The alpha cells make the famous glucagon. Okay, I'll again real, real quickly recap what they do and, and some of the implications. We'll talk a little bit about the beta cell secretion of insulin. Nobody cannot not know that one, okay? So the beta cells, insulin. And then the delta cells makes a hormone called somatostatin, which is basically a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Some of the older texts, they use GHIH, which is a growth hormone made by a pituitary gland that corresponds to muscle growth and bone density development. Yep, I think the battery just died. I'll have to change it in a second. And then the last one is the pancreatic polypeptide cells. And these ones make the pancreatic polypeptide secretion. Okay, so let's go over the cell types briefly. The first kind of cell is the alpha cell. The alpha cell is going to create the hormone glucagon. Let me, let me change it back. Over here, we have the alpha cells. The alpha cells secrete the hormone glucagon. And this is the one that regulates your blood, your blood glucose levels by accelerating the breakdown of conversion. So when your body is deprived of sugar, you tap into that glucose stored version called glycogen, which is phosphor phosphorylated, and you kind of break it off. And then you go through glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen. You also can convert nutrients of macros into sugars, the gluconeogenesis. So those two processes are ramped up. Okay, so glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. The exact counter to this one will then be the beta cells. The beta cells are gonna then secrete insulin and their main function is to reduce that sugar, right? So again, implications of diabetes, when we talk about the diabetes mellitus, there's type 1, type 2, and I'll go over that as an application today. But the main function is to convert sugars into the stored form of glycogen, and this is the opposite called glycogenesis. Okay, genesis is the formation, genolysis is the breakdown. There's also some boosting activity of fatty acid metabolism. So when your body needs to move those fats into the mitochondria, you require, you require a certain kind of transporters. There are carnitine acyl transporters that'll move the fatty acid in and quickly go through beta oxidation. 
a series of steps goes along and you make acetylcholate and then you have the levogenesis. And then the last one is protein simulation. So this relies mostly in the Krebs cycle when you have the citric acid cycle. There's a intermediate called alpha ketoglutarate, which is very versatile. It gets converted into other versions of amino acids. And then glutamate eventually can become glutamine and other kinds of amino acids to change the amine group through the urea cycle. So that's stimulation of protein. But it's important to notice that if you look at the cartoon, most of the alpha cells, right? When you look at the pancreas, these are located on the outer ridges of the islets of Langerhans. Okay, so just remember, alpha cells are on the border. That's the best way to discriminate. And then the beta cells and delta cells generally are a little bit closer towards the center region. Okay? That, that's probably when you see a smear and then the cells are not any tinted in any way. They're not color coded and it's very low resolution. Just go off of the border versus the center. That's usually the better way. The third cell type is going to be your delta cells. These are also found next to beta cells. Very hard to dis discriminate, but they secrete the somatostatin. And the main function here is that it actually inhibits the secretion of insulin in Google. So there's a negative feedback. A lot of the endocrine system revolves around feedback systems. There's, there's usually three, two to three interactions. When a hormone works well with the other one and they amplify the effects, we call that synergistic. So one hormone synergizes with the other one. If one hormone can generate the ability for the other hormone's receptor to become more responsive, so they also subtly synergize, that's permissive. And then the third one is when they go and counter. That's an antagonistic, right? And those interactions are key. And then of course, whenever it's antagonistic, there's a feedback. That means when you have a lot more of this hormone, it starts to regulate and say, hey, your body is good. We can afford to stop making that hormone. So it blocks the signals. So somatostatin plays a role to inhibit alpha and beta cell activity. Slows down your GI's motility for absorption, so reduces the absorption of nutrition going in. Gives your body enough time to process, because that means you already have enough nutrients. You have enough growth going on, so your body will, will hit that stop. And then the last one here is the pancreatic polypeptide. This is made by the pancreatic polypeptide cells. These are also found dispersed around that mid-region and also the border, so it's Again, very hard to discriminate when you're just looking at histological slide. Its main function is to inhibit the somatostatin, but it does boost the contraction of the gallbladder. So last week, we briefly talked about something called CCK, cholecystokinin, right? Cholecystokinin, secretin, these are made by your, which kind of cell types, remember? Right, the enteroendocrine cells. In what area of the GI? Right, the, the small intestine, right? That's gonna be where now that after the stomach has done its job, you're gonna neutralize the acidic contents, the chyme, and you wanna take, take, take a slower step to get that acidic contents into your small intestine. So ultimately, what happens is you're gonna able to now squeeze the gallbladder, produce more of the, gall, the bile juices from the liver, and you're gonna push it in via the common bile duct, and then drainage occurs, okay? So that's gonna be your polypeptide, pancreatic polypeptide. And then over here, as far as the exocrine function goes, is that you're going to have digestive enzymes being pumped out the acini. Now, these acinides are the ones that are the cell types around the islet, so around those circular cells. And this is a pretty good image. I actually like this one out of most of the images I've seen because it gives you a very clear definition of what the cell types are. But these ones secrete mostly sodium bicarbonate via the duct cells. And then the enzymes, like the pancreatic amylase, the enteropeptidases, the trypsinogen, the trypsin, the activated versions, these ones are all made by the uh, acini cells. All right, so let me zoom in. So at this point, you should know that there's one super important buffer in the human body, which is the bicarbonate, right? It's used throughout, inside the kidneys, your GI tract, and your lungs at HCO3 minus, neutralizing additional protons, then converts into carbonic acid, and carbonic acid, which is an intermediate, becomes CO2. So your body processes most of the high acidic components as CO2, and then you get rid of it. So if you look over here, you can see this is a zoom up into one small little pocket of the pancreas. The outer region, these little darker red regions are all the acini, okay? And then as we said before, all the alpha cells are located where? The border or on the inner region? 
border. So the alpha cells are towards the border. So I'm going to trace it with the red line. And then the beta cells and the delta cells, very hard to discriminate, but they're generally found towards the inner region. Okay, that, that's that's honestly my best tip. It's super, I don't think it'll be fair for you to have an image to say, you know, which one is the alpha cell, beta cells. Generally, it's going to be, oh, sorry, not alpha cells, beta cells, but the beta cells, delta cells. Okay? Alpha cells, beta cells, you can discriminate outer region, inner region. But then the beta and delta is kind of tricky. It, it's just, they're so close together and they're, there's going to be different in terms of genetic variation. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the population. So when you talk about diseases and you talk about specific structures, it's not all the same. As a little case study. So, all right, so welcome back, guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more on the pancreas. So as we said before the break, the main function is that we have both endocrine and exocrine activities, right? The exocrine activity revolves around the digestive enzymes, the sini, produces those juices, and then the duct cells secrete the bicarbonate. So we mix it in, neutralizing the acid, and then there's also these brush border enzymes. The two that I'll pinpoint is enteropeptidases. They break down the peptide bonds, and then trypsinogen to trypsin for breaking down the, uh, the proteins. Over here, a visual showing you the pancreas. As zooming into the drainage site, you'll notice that the pancreatic duct connects the entirety of the pancreas from the tail all the way to the head. This juncture then scatters around to smaller subcapillaries that's not shown here, but if you look closely at each of these islets, in the middle of almost every single islet is going to be small crevices or these little kind of smash tubes of capillaries. And this is where the juices can drain in. Okay, so there's a lot of blood flow entering the pancreas. As far as the movement goes, this is some of the activation of the enzyme. I know this is a little bit more physiology centric, but I do want to show you the two images here. And they actually put, paint a really good picture on how this works. So the zymogens are generally inactivated. When the body needs to tap into those enzymes, then you trigger the activation of them. So over here, you'll see that in the brush border, we went over this last week, the brush border is a structure inside the villi of the small intestine, within the villi, we have these microvilli. These inactivated zymogens include chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase, procolipase, and prophospholipase. These are the four main dominant inactivated versions. All, each four of these will then have the activated form. Okay, They get triggered usually by the activity of trypsin and also detectants of presence of protein or macros. So the activated form is as follows. We have the Chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, colipase, and phospholipase. Okay, colipase and lipase are different, even though they're similar. They're two sub different kind of enzymatic functions. Lipase breaks down the lipid actual bond between the glycerol head fatty acid. The colipase helps with the emulsification portion. Okay? So slightly different in terms of activity. On the right side, as I said earlier, is that there's also secretion by carbonate. If there's one buffer you need to know that you can, this also translates to physiology, is the bicarbonate HCO3 minus buffer. If you look closely, the, on the lumen side of your pancreas or small intestine, we have these transporters that move bicarbonate into the lumen for an exchange of which ion? For chloride. Okay, so chloride is a negative charge ion. Oftentimes it's going to counter port between the other negative charge ion. As the chloride comes in, it gets move through the CFTR channel, the chloride dedicated channel, and the bicarbonate, if you see over here, gets converted to this CO2 with an enzyme called CA. Anybody know what CA stands for? No, 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 not, not, what, what enzyme? This is, not, this is not the ion. What enzyme is CA? This is also related in your blood system. So if you went over blood, if you went over the metabolism inside your lungs, anybody? Nice. Really good, Andy. I like that. So the enzyme is called carbonic. This one, you can't forget this, guys. This is this is literally head to toe from renal system to the, the respiratory system. Carbonic anhydrase, right? Anhydrase. This is the enzyme that is found inside the pancreatic cells and intestinal cells that converts bicarbonate into carbonic acid and CO2. It does it at a very efficient pace. So now you have CO2 and CO2 and water gets dispersed out, okay? On the right side into the interstitial fluid, we have the sodium proton pump, anti-port. So protons go out for sodium coming in. An NK pump that transports the sodium out to the lumen, or oh, so not the lumen, sorry, the capillary. And potassium goes in the cell. 
and the water goes through. So a few things going on. Carbonic anhydrates is going to manipulate the bicarbonate to CO2. As the CO2 is building up, you also get rid of the proton. The proton moves through against the transport of sodium. And then the NaK pump, which utilizes ATP, maintains that gradient. Okay, so that, that's, that's, the, that's the most important part in terms of acid-base balance and maintaining the alkalinic juices. Now, the pancreas is, of course, supplied by a couple of key structures. The blood vessel that goes directly to it is going to all come from the sub-branch of the splenic artery, but more specifically, it's divided into the superior and the inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries. This is the subdivision. And then we also will have the subsets from the coming, depending on some populations, the superior ventricular artery subbranches. Okay, quite a bit of blood flow. On the right side, you'll see the splenic artery being the main one coming down. And then it subbranches into the inferior and superior pancreatic duodenal arteries. The uh, venous drainage follows just as the same. And then the key lymphatic nodes is the pancreatic splenic nodes. So they share the same one. On the bottom here, you can see the picture. This is pretty nice. This image is actually shown with the, the four sets. So we have the one on the bottom with the lymph nodes over here. So you can see they're all scattered around the body, a little bit around the tail. The blood vessel on top, the splenic artery comes down and then it branches out to the pancreatic artery and it goes to the superior region and then the inferior region on the bottom. On the right side, we have the vein, splenic vein. You can see the blue, the blue tinted region. So it's a little bit more clear throughout the head, neck, the body and the tail. And then on the bottom here, we're going to have the nerve plexus. I didn't spend too much time going over the nerve system, except for the fact that you do have the vagus also supplying regions into the celiac ganglion. And this celiac ganglion then subdivides to the sympathetic trunk that then supplies a region of the spleen. I mean, not, not too much function occurs in the spleen, but the pancreas does what? In your, in your sympathetic activity, what does it do? Is it going to constrict the juices? or enhance juices, sympathetic, constrict. Then when your vagus activity begins to trigger and the celiac trunk activates and your parasympathetic mode takes over, what happens? It enhances the juices and the production of the bicarbonate. Okay, so the bicarbonate transition becomes a little bit more active and those, those enzymogens I just talked about, those four key inactivated enzymes get turned on and released in. Okay, cool, good. So those are the key features and then as far as innervation goes, like I said, the pancreatic system is going to trigger two hormones to interplay. And it directly controls the hormones of the secretin and cholecystokinin because it's right by your small intestine. And then just like I said, the sympathetic fibers are responsible for causing you to either slow it down. But in terms of fight or flight response, you also have pain detection. So your pain triggering around your spleen might result in your body saying, okay, well, this is too much. This might cause discomfort. For example, if you are not a runner and you decide to run a marathon and you're huffing and puffing, your spleen region starts to feel discomfort because of the pain. And that nerve signal is because of sympathetic division. That's also why usually your left side, if you just go and run and sprint and you don't have the conditioning, your left region, your left upper quadrant will have pain. That's because your sympathetic division triggering that pain impulse. Okay. And then the vagus nerve divides, we went over this before, into the celiac plexus, superior mesenteric plexus, and these plexuses will then innervate all those regions inside the lower GI. All right, so this is your autonomic nervous system controlling. The only clinical application I have for the pancreas, of course, is your diabetes mellitus. Right? Diabetes affects over 30 million people. There's a precursor when you have that elevated A1C level that's starting to peak up. And hyperglycemia is, again, the hallmark, right? So when you have a patient coming in, they have a fasting glucose level of over 120, something's going on. There are two types. We have the type 1, which is the autoimmune disorder characterized by the self-destruction of the beta cells. So when the beta cells get compromised and you just don't have the ability to make the insulin, that's type 1. Type 2 is going to be adult onset. That could be because of lifestyle, genetic factors, environmental factors, but over time, maybe insulin sensitivity decreases. Either insulin, the hormone isn't as responsive or the receptors don't respond. That one, there's no cure. That one, there is just a lifestyle modification, the kind of food you tend to eat, 
Some of the symptoms you're going to see oftentimes in a board slide question involve frequent urination, boosting in hunger, changes in the fatigue level, weight loss, and in some cases, blurred vision because of the retinopathy over time. And then the main one here I put in bold is ketoacidosis. So some disorders will generally favor a slightly higher boost in proton because your pancreas now, the cells I just showed you earlier, they're damaged. If the cells are damaged, that proton and the sodium pump, the antiport now is also compromised. So you can't manage the bicarbonate and the protons, so your body becomes a little bit more acidic. And because your body can't secrete the enzymes, your body now shifts to other sources of energy. Oftentimes tapping into fatty acid, the beta, beta oxidation, and that leads into more of the ketone body production, the alpha butyrate, acetoacetate, acetone, and that creates that ketoacidic condition in the body. Okay, so that's our your clinical application. All right, so let's, let me do this first, guys. We're gonna do the case study first, because this one is related to your... So one of the clinical applications that could arise that you may have heard about is called the ruptured spleen. And in both cases, the spleen and the pancreas is very vulnerable. So if you're going through specific trauma to the abdominal pelvic cavity, they could rupture and burst open. Rupture of spleen causes a lot of pain that can lead to oftentimes this great amount of bleeding, this intraperitoneal hemorrhage. And then because of that, leading to specific infections. And so oftentimes you do have an option of going through splenectomy where you can trim off regions of the damaged spleen to reduce the blood flow to that area. Right? You would ligate the blood vessel, the splenic artery, you would solder it a little bit and just reduce the blood flow. The pancreas can also be ruptured as well. So oftentimes, if you think about the most common way to get this occurring is if you're in a car accident. If you're driving behind a wheel, and many times when a person gets in a car accident, the wheel of the car literally can press into your abdomen so hard that it ruptures that region. It's actually, if you think about it, your wheel of the car positions right at that region. And majority of the time, whenever patients come in with a ruptured pancreas, it's because of a car accident. You hit something, the force of the trauma slides you into the wheel and the bottom of the wheel indents down onto the ribs, which then puncture the spleen or the pancreas. And so that can cause a lot of pain, but just showing you this is a common kind of trauma-based injury to this organ. Okay, and then of course, uh, we also went over all the organs and, and structures of the lower GI from last week, including today's spleen and pancreas. And this is a, a list, this is the, uh, kind of a cheat sheet for you. The Items on the left are intraperitoneal, which means these are organs generally a little bit more mobile. They're generally gonna be structures within the peritoneum and they have the mesentery, okay? So this is a nice chart that I also use for the med school. Give you a quick snapshot. On the right side, we have everything that is retroperitoneal. These are the organs that are generally fixed. They're less mobile and they're located outside the peritoneum, okay? Going down the list, stomach is going to be intra. Part one of the duodenum is also intra. Jejunum ileum is also intra. Cecum appendix, transverse colon, sigma colon, your liver and the gallbladder, the tail of the pancreas, let's put a start to that one, the spleen, the ovaries, and the upper one third of the rectum. The last little bit of lecture we'll go over today is on the rectum, but just be mindful, the upper one third, a very small region, is intra. The lower two third is going to be retro. Now on the right side, the retroperitoneal organs involve our kidneys, ureters, the drainage of the urine, parts two, three, four of the duodenum, ascending, descending colon, lower two third of the rectum, so I'll circle that one, head, neck, body of the pancreas, adrenal glands, abdominal aorta, and inferior vena cava. Okay, so this is very helpful. I hope this is gonna give you a clear picture on which ones are retro, which ones are intro. Okay, this is gonna, be good, especially when you're doing the dissections. And I'll show you this with the with the live cadaver in a second. Now the rectum and the anal canal serves as the final portion of your food tube. Okay, so after all is said and done, we started our, our journey last week with the esophagus. We transitioned to the stomach. We then went into the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum. We made a little exit into the colon. We talked about the cecum, the appendix. Ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and now finally, after the sigma colon, we have the rectum. The rectum is continuous with the sigma colon, and there is a small flexure called the anal rectal flexure, which is an 80-degree curvature 
right where the sigma colon goes up. And this is important because this maintains your fecal waste. You don't want fecal matter to come out involuntarily. So feces are gonna build up after the waste, after all the, the nutrients are absorbed and the water is taken out, you have the opportunity for any kind of last, last pulling of water. And the pubal rectalis muscle helps maintain the tonus of this movement. Obviously this, you know, with a good bowel movement, with the right amount of food and fiber, enables a nice movement of this region. Within the actual anal canal in the rectum, you this juncture, you'll see there's these folds called the rectal folds. There's a superior one on the bottom right image. There's an inferior one, and there's also a medium, kind of middle region. There's three main folds, and these folds ensure that you pass the waist down in one direction, right? No backflowing. This also allows the gases to pass as well. And then in order to support the lower pelvic region, you're going to have two key muscles and one ligament. One is the sphincters sets, so they're the anal sphincter. They control the opening and the, the, the defecation reflex. And then the levator ani. The levator ani, if you look at the picture, this is what upholds the base of the anal canal. Okay, so obviously you, you, know, you have this sphinc sphincter that closes down. When the pressure builds up, and the waste accumulates, you're gonna have the urge to want to relax and defecate. A parasympathetic then triggers this region to then relax and then you go to the restroom. So there are three folds that I highlighted and there is one ligament that maintains the upper position. This is the anal coccygeal ligament. And then the ampulla is also relevant because the ampulla helps you maintain uh, that the kind of um, the involuntary aspect. So you don't want this non-controlled defecation occurring. So let's zoom in a little bit. I know this picture is not the best. Zoom into the red rectum and the anal canal. This is a little bit more clear. The levator ani, I'll circle it for you. Levator ani is the muscle on the left and right side. It spans from the outer portions of the anus and it kind of goes all the way down to the lower part of the sphincter, the external anal sphincter that I circled on the bottom. The internal sphincter, this is the involuntary controlled one based on pressure. If you guys notice that, you also see there are columns. Okay, so this anal tube has these longitudinal lines. These are called anal columns. And then these concave surfaces are the sinuses. And so it, it's, a, it's a system that allows you to trap the waste, maintains the integrity so it builds up, eventually going for you to trigger the, the use of restroom. The tissue also transitions very interesting. Okay, so what I'm gonna now do is we're gonna go from the external structures, the muscles, we went over the involuntary internal anal sphincter and then the voluntary external sphincter to the tissue subtypes. The tissue is pretty cool. If you look over here, actually look, we'll come back to this. I'm going to jump around. If you look closely at the histological image, so this is the real thing. Okay, so the earlier what I showed you was all cartoon. This is the real one. We have three zones. This is the internal anal sphincter. All right, this is the external sphincter. But if you look closely at the tissue, there are three zones of tissue types. And this is one of those examples inside the human body where literally within a cell, you see a transition. If I were to zoom into that image where I have the circle, you could see the differentiation of the cell type. It's actually pretty cool. This first zone is called the CRZ zone. CRZ stands for colo rectal, right between the border of the colon and the rectum. Within that upper one third of the rectal canal, rectal to the anal canal, you're gonna have only simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so this is important to note. So if you were to do a biopsy, or if you were to look at a hemorrhoid, right? So let's say a patient comes in, they have a hemorrhoid, and you wanna see how deep that hemorrhoid has grown, or if you cut it out and you do a biopsy, then if you see if it is simple columnar, that means it's penetrated all the way up to the one third of the rectum. Okay, and then the second zone is called the ATZ zone. This stands for anal transition zone. This is the middle border of the three sections. Most of the time, you're gonna find stratified columnar. So you go from simple columnar to stratified columnar. You might see a little bit of dispersion of stratified cuboidal. Not often, but that's why I have the term minor in there. And then once you get down towards the anal canal, also known as SQZ zone, this is known as the squamous zone, you're gonna find only stratified squamous. So what's really fascinating is if you get a look closely at the tissue, you will see the columnar become the squamous right at the board. So if you were to zoom into this little border right here, 
and let me use another color. Uh, if you use, if you were to have a, a biopsy of just this little blue area of cell type, you will see a transition of columnar to squamous cells. And again, the significance of this is if you ever need to do a biopsy, they can tell you precisely how far that hemorrhoid or that fistula, fistula is usually a deeper growth after a hemorrhoid is not treated, and it penetrates all the way in. And oftentimes, one of the treatments of, of hemorrhoids is what? How do you treat a hemorrhoid? What's one option? You can either cauterize it off, you can use like a little ring and, and, and squeeze it off, or you cut and surgically resect it, right? And, and it's, it's a vulnerable place. If you think about it, it's right by your anal canal. I had a friend that had this done before and they would have infections all the time because that's where your waste passes. And literally that opening wound will never, it's, it's, even though you suture it up, the healing process is so risky because you're constantly exposed to bacteria, okay? But the whole point is you would go in depending on how deep it is, and then you would retract, retract it. Okay, so let's go back one slide. So now, of course, there's quite a bit of blood flow in the rectum and anal canal. The main arteries is as follows. Since we have three regions of the rectum, we're going to have three sets of arteries. We have the superior artery that goes into the proximal upper one-third. We have the middle art artery. This is going to go to the right and left side. And this is going to then subdivide into the inferior artery, which supplies to the anal canal. Okay, so just be mindful. The right and left Rectal arteries supply the middle and inferior parts of the rectum. The inferior rectal artery supplies the anal canal. It's the very bottom region. So why is this important? If you look at the image, let's say you have a hemorrhoid, right? Hemorrhoid is just the outgrowth, a little you know, tissue that overgrows on the external side, and that could penetrate deep within. So let's say you had a patient, and then this hemorrhoid is shown in blue, grows all the way in here. Okay, it grows all the way in here, and now because of this, there's a lot of pain, discomfort, there's obstruction of the feces. You can't, you can't get the waste out. And as a result of this, let's say you go through surgery and the surgeon needs to block the blood flow, right? Because the last thing you want is if you were to cut in, you don't want massive bleeding. So you would have to suture or ligate one of the blood vessels. If the hemorrhoid is only on the external side, then you would probably be fine just by ligating the inferior rectal artery, right? That way you don't, completely kill the blood flow to all the area. You reduce whatever is immediate and go from there. The venous drainage is gonna be the superior, middle, and inferior rectal veins. The main innervation comes from the vesicular venous plexus for the males, and for the females, the utero vaginal venous plexus. So I do wanna highlight that for males and females because it is different. It has the two different sub-branches, okay? So as the blood vessels come down, so by the way, if you're thinking where do these come from, they all come from the pudendal, right? So it comes down, you have that iliac common branch artery, you wrap around, you have then the pudendal arteries, and then along the branches, along the inferior mesenteric, you're gonna have sub-branches of the middle rectal, superior rectal, and so forth, okay? So that is important to be mindful of. And then here is a picture showing you the sympathetic system conversion, so sympathetic, comes from the lumbar spinal cord, going through the hypogastric and the pelvic plexuses, and then the parasympathetic is gonna originate from the S2 to S4 spinal cord. They're gonna then come by and innervate via the pelvic splanchnic nerves, all the way down to the inferior hypogastric. So on the right, you can see this is the picture of the defecation reflex. So when this pressure builds up over here and the feces accumulate, that pressure sends signals of stretch, triggering the pelvic plexus systems to then fire goes through the S1 to S4, S2 to S4 region. This region causes you to want to relax. The sphincters naturally, the internal sphincters relax. So that's when you have the urge, oh my God, I got to use the restroom. And then you squat, you sit down, the vacation reflex occurs, okay? So this is via this S2 to S4 public sponsored nerves and also the inferior hypogastric. And I just went over this already. This is very important. The transition of the tissue. So simple columnar stratified columnar, simple squamous. Okay, this is one small transitional zone. Hemorrhoids are, are interesting, right? This is the example I used as the clinical application. There are two classes of hemorrhoids. They're, the cause of this is hard to pinpoint. Sometimes they believe it's dietary related. This also could be congenital. When you are pregnant or you change the dietary system in the abdominal pelvic cavity, 
oftentimes you might develop a hemorrhoid, this outgrowth. And the outgrowth, this recess, is usually based on the waste and fecal matter discharge. There are two kinds. We have the external versus the internal. External means it's only limited on the lower part of the anal rectal line between the transition. And if it's internal, it goes all the way up. And then depending on how deep this this kind of hemorrhoid, this, uh, hemorrhoid can grow, so I'm just gonna show you with the blue line, it could grow all the way up. And then when it gets that deep, in some cases it can become a fistula, like an indentation, and it's a dead mass of tissue. And then usually this obstructs even more. Okay, and this is why it's interesting when you are going to invasively cut something out, you wanna know how deep to go into. The ligation is pretty common. This is a picture showing you the division. So right here, if you look at it, the superior rectal valve, middle rectal valve, and rectal valve, these three regions correspond to the upper parts of the rectum. The anal rectal ring is going to be the board. So anything below this ring would consider be external. Anything above that would be probably internal as a hemorrhoid. If you're curious, this is approximately two centimeters in. Right? So you can also, if you were to get a palp, you know, get like a um, kind of a digital rectal exam, pretty common, you would measure about two centimeters in, and that gives you the length of where that canal ring would be at. So it's about two centimeters up your anus, and that's gonna be right at the ring. Anything above that will be considered inside the uh, internal hemorrhoid. Okay, so just remember two centimeters is pretty close as far as a, a range, in some cases like 1.5, but two to three is, is a pretty common digital rectal exam. All right, and that's it guys. That's it for today's lecture. We'll take a quick break, we'll do questions. We do have like 10, 10 questions to go through.